This segment is brought to you by Les Stanford Cadillac Chevrolet in Dearborn, Michigan. Please visit lesstanford.com. Hey everyone, welcome into Inside the Pizza Oven. I am your host, Freddie the Pizza Man. With me today, Super Bowl champion, Eddie Murray. What's up, Eddie? Always a pleasure. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Really, really, really appreciate it. Really appreciate it. Today yeah. I got you winning Super Bowl rings to making pizza today. I'm all for it. Let's all do right. it. Let's yeah. get your apron on. Okay, let's go. Let's get your apron. And we're going to make some pizza. Have you ever made a pizza? I'll be honest, no. No? I've eight lots, but that's about it. That's all I got for you. Isn't it funny? I watched you as a kid kicking field goals, and now, uh -huh. you're, now you're with me making pizza. That's It'll great. be great. That's yeah. great. So what do, we, what do we start with? Well, today, you, you can watch me here a little bit make the pizza. It's yep. basically just like this, mm -hmm. like this, and you're going to do the same thing. Okay. There you go. So, Eddie, you got a lot going. You got a lot to your story from being in England watching George Best, one of your favorite athletes, Absolutely. kicking soccer balls, yep. to keep playing in the NFL, winning a Super Bowl now with Hope Network. I want to touch mm -hmm. on Hope Network, but let's go. Let's start with the Super Bowl, okay. the pinnacle of an NFL player. Yep. You, you win a Super Bowl with the Dallas Cowboys in 1993. How did the season start for you? And obviously we know how it ended, but how did yeah. it start? Well, it, it actually started uh, I had the, the year after I left the Detroit Lions in 91. Uh, I went to play for Tampa Bay halfway through when Sam Weish was the head coach, God rest his soul, yep. um, uh, at Tampa Bay. Uh, so I went in for the last seven games of the year, played with Tampa Bay, got asked to come back to training camp, and had a really good training camp. And uh, being an older player at that time, um, they had... Uh, not that old, though. Well, I mean, at that time, at, maybe uh, NFL, I was still considered not, yeah, older. Yeah. Uh, so they had also uh, drafted uh, Michael Houston. Yeah. And uh, he was a great kicker. And uh, as the, we were getting closer to the uh, final cutdown, Coach Weiss came up to me before the last preseason game and says, Hey, Eddie, look, this one let you know we're going to carry two kickers. Michael's really good, wow. but he's still a rookie, and uh, we're you know, a young team, and I, I want someone I can rely on. So I just want to let you know, you know we're going to carry two kickers. So unfortunately, in the last preseason game, they had like three guys just fluke got injuries that were major injuries where I think two of the guys were going to be out for the year. One of them was going to be out for, for quite a few weeks. And Coach Weiss brought me in and he goes, hey, Ed, look, things changed. So we have to change our roster around. We can't carry two guys. So I'm going to roll the dice, go with Michael. But you've had such a phenomenal training camp and you've get really dedicated yourself and you're in a great shape. You deserve to play. Is there one team out there that you want me to give you give a team a call for? And I happen to be watching because being the older guy, I was looking at how the, yeah, the so roster cool. was going to f fall out. Sure. And um, just seeing games going on at that time. And I said, hey, the Dallas Cowboys, you know, if you wouldn't mind. And so that kind of put me out there that I had a coach talking about how well I'd been doing. I was in, I was in really good uh, physical shape. And of course, I was kicking really good. And then all of a sudden, two weeks into the year, I get a call from the Dallas Cowboys to come and try out. Well, let me ask you. I, I mean, obviously, you were on the last Lions playoff win, 1991. Nin 91, Nin yes. Yeah, 91 season. 90, yep. Okay. Yep. So they, they draft a, they draft a uh, Jason. field goal, Jason, the next year. Yep. And then they you go to Tampa Bay, then they decide to go with the rookie. Before even Dallas comes along, you're an NFL, you're an NFL veteran. Mm -hmm. Now, you say you were old, but in NFL terms, maybe you're an older player. But how do you feel like a team lets you go and every team lets you go? How do you feel at that time being an NFL player, say? I mean, well, the, the, what's, your mind, what's your mindset? Well, the, the, the thing, there's only two positions where there's no backups. Yeah. Kicker and punter. Yeah. We usually back each other up if someone gets hurt that game. Yeah. But they always then bring someone else in after the game. So there's no backup kicker and no backup punter. So that means there's only, well, now there's 32 teams. When I was playing, there was 30. So That's there's right. only 30 positions. But there's a lot of guys who deserve to be playing in the league who just didn't quite find the right situation. And so that was always my mindset. I always considered myself one of the top 30 guys. And if my situation where I was unemployed because of a situation like with rosters, uh, with uh, Tampa Bay, having to make changes for their team at the time, I knew that I, I would, if there was an incumbent or if there was an injury with a, a, a player, that, that I would get a call to go work out. Yeah. And then it's just how well I do at that workout. So that was my mindset. My mindset was even though I was unemployed, I was still 
doing the same schedule as I would if I was on a, on a team. I would go work out, I would lift, I would run, I would do all the things like I would if I was on a team. So that was always my mindset to stay game ready. So now you go to a team that just came off a Super Bowl. Mm -hmm. By the way, the Lions beat that team. Uh, yeah, in the 91 year. Yes. You were part of. Absolutely. And it was, it was talked about that these were two of the teams of the 90s. Sure. The Lions and the Detroit and Dallas. Yep. Well, obviously, we know what happened with Dallas, but you go to a team with a bunch of Eagles, guys that won the Super Bowl. How did that season go for you? Well, it was uh, the only Emma way I can. Smith. Well, the well, the only way I can put it, it was like being in a rock band. I yeah. mean, they had uh, number one, they were America's team. They've always yeah. been America's yeah. team, so they've yeah. always had the cachet behind them. Um, tremendous support, not only of course in Dallas, but also on the road. I mean, uh, they traveled well as fans. So, um, and then coming off the Super Bowl that they, they had won the year before at the Rose Bowl, uh, you know, there was a lot of attention. You know, I was used to. Detroit's locker room, yeah. you would, you know, every day media would be there. There would be, I don't know, maybe 10, 12 media, local beat guys, yeah. and then there would yeah. be the odd columnist or someone coming in from out of town. They might have or the teams for and Tom Landry in Dallas. And so with <laughs> Dallas, it was, there was 50, 60 people wow. every day yeah. trying to get some kind of an angle on a story and what was going on. Twist something so up. it was, it was different. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for me, I just kind of hung under their coattails, and uh, we rode through the season and finished 12 and four, and then ended up winning the Super Bowl again. Who was the punter there? That uh, uh, it was a rookie, actually, John Jett, who yeah. ended up coming to Ex Detroit. Exactly. Yeah, John and I became very close friends. Uh, he and his wife Jackie, and um, we, uh, you know, what we were trying to help each other out. You know, me navigating Dallas and what they were before and for yeah. him also getting his feet wet as a rookie but he did a phenomenal job. Well, let's start making some pizza. Let's jump in to make some pizza. Okay. And uh, I'm going to put this on here. Yeah. Okay. Let's get uh what roll good? Yeah. Let me let me get it a little bit bigger for you. And okay. then uh all right, let's put some sauce on the pizza. Okay. So, and then we're gonna, we got to talk about that uh, Super Bowl. And uh, so, how was the how was it playing in the Super Bowl? Uh, it was. Um, I, I didn't notice any difference with it because it was um, it was a year uh, that normally what they do now is uh, they play the two NFC weeks. and and uh, AFC Championship game, yeah. and then there's two weeks before yeah. the Super Bowl. Well, my year, what it was, they, the following week, so we beat San Francisco in the NFC Championship game in Dallas, and uh, Monday we had a team meeting early, and by Monday afternoon we were on the plane heading out to, uh, heading out to uh, Atlanta. So one, so, so, uh, one, so one week? Yep. One week, and... Uh, so you don't, you got to get tickets, you got to get tickets for families. You, you got to do all of that. So, yeah. you know, they gave us, um, they gave us a deadline uh, to, uh, to do this. And um, one more in the middle. That's good. Yeah, Let's oh yeah, go. we got a plank of good. Lots of cheese. Yeah. I know you like the meat, so sure. I got some meats there for you. You pick up what you like. Okay. I'm going to make this one the standard old school cheese pizza. So I'm going to put okay. the cheese and I'm going to put some olive oil and I'm going to put some basil. So. Did you kick any field goals in the? In the uh, I uh, I actually had a really good game. I was three out of three in field goals and oh, three fantastic. out of three in extra points. Fantastic. So I had a lot of activity. Uh, I know for me, um, and being older at the time, I normally go out and just kind of kick around a little bit before we do. Uh, look at you. Any, look at you. Cool. Yeah. Look at uh, that. Doing uh, awesome. you know just kicking with. Um, uh, John Jett holding for me and just kind of walking yeah. around, getting some of their nerves to get so out of So he was your holder during the season, or was it the... He would hold before the games. So Jay Novacek was the... Jay, the that's yeah, right. Yeah, Jay, Jay was a phenomenal... He had phenomenally soft hands. I Great mean, you could too. never hear him catching the ball. That's how, wow. uh, you know, uh, you really know someone's got some pretty soft hands. And um, uh, not only, you know, had a great temperament. You know, he was very calm kind of a guy. And... Um, so I was out kicking, but I, w I was really nervous. You know, I, m most games when I would go do it, you would go out to the stadium, and there wouldn't be that many people in the stands, you know. Yeah. Uh, but Super Bowl, of course, they open it up. You yeah. know, uh, people are going there. It's an event. It's, yeah. uh, it's an experience to go early and experience uh, what's going on yeah. pregame. And there was a lot of celebrities on the sidelines and stuff, and I, felt I was having a really bad, like, warm-up for myself. And um, when I came out with the, the specialist doing the snapping and holding and that, I didn't have that great of a, of a warm-up. And I, I was 
concerned. I'm going, oh my God, you know, I, I got to try to calm myself down. Yeah, could you imagine that? And so, luckily for me, um, we lost the, um, uh, we won the coin toss, decided to receive. Um, Kevin Williams, our return guy, returned wow. the ball all the way back almost, uh, I think, over the 50. It was like the 48, 45 yard line. And we went like three plays and didn't get anything out of it. And I kicked a long field goal. So, like, within wow. the first minute of, of and a half of the game, yeah. I had to go out. Calm your nerves, right? And now. I just, just hit it pure, right down the middle. And then I was fine. And then it just became another game. It wasn't the Super Bowl. It just became another game. Yeah. And, and I really calmed myself. And we didn't have the greatest the first half. We were down 13-6 to six at halftime. And then they never scored again. And we ended up winning 30 Well, 13. the Buffalo Bills were due to win one. So everyone well, thought, you know, like, yes. that was number three for Buffalo, right? <laughs> number four. That was Oh, that was number one. four. So, was I mean, four. everyone was probably rooting for Buffalo. I had there was I, a lot of Buffalo fans. Yeah, yeah. Yes, so I would were. imagine. Yes. Buffalo, please win the Super yes, Bowl. Yes, exactly. So, yeah. yeah, that's yeah. great. Great so, experience. So... So you played with Michael Irvin, Emma Smith, Troy Aikman, some of the, yep. and you you made other stops with Kansas City before that. Yep. Did you play with Joe Montana with the, the Kansas City? No, Joe City was team? not there when I was there. No. Okay. So uh, we had uh, there was uh, Steve DeBerg. Steve DeBerg, that's yep. right. And then you played with uh, Philadelphia, where I'm Minnesota. So you were, you played with a lot of great players. Any of them that yes. you still keep in touch with? Any of them um, impact in your life? Uh, most of my. Um, my relationships are with the people I played with Detroit because not only the amount of years, 12 years here, yeah. but I live here. I'm yeah. part of the alumni association here. Yeah. So a lot of my relationships are mostly with uh, uh, with my Lions um, uh, alumni. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I, I see a lot of guys with doing events sometimes. I know uh, uh, Emmett and Troy and I used to play an awful lot of golf together. So we see each other at golf outings every now and again. And uh, I, I keep in touch with a handful of guys from different teams, just, uh, you know, uh, whether it's through social media type of things yeah. that are out there. And, um, you know, just kind of keep abreast of how they're doing and their families. I'm thinking when you were with Philadelphia and maybe Minnesota, you had to cross paths with uh, Randall Cunningham. He Randall was, and I, yeah, he was another big golf. Of course, golf is yeah. my, my first love. Yeah, like, we gotta talk about and so, that. I, you know, I... I kind of always look for the guys that like to golf a lot, and, and Randall was one of them. He was actually a pretty good player, too. Yeah, he was one of my favorites growing up, and we yep. watch these quarterbacks today transition, mm -hmm. and they always say, well, these guys are, I, I always look back to Randall Cunningham and sure. Warren Moon, and those are the, some of the, the two guys that really took the quarterback level to Well, a, to Randall took it because he was such a great runner also. Oh, yeah, you know, I mean, he was even before Michael Vick. So yep. he was, yes. you know, and back, like, I, I'm, I'm now aging myself. I mean, Bobby Douglas was a running back, uh, uh, quarterback, running quarterback, I should say, for the Chicago Bears. Yeah. So, you know, those kind of guys kind of evolved. But uh, Randall had a phenomenal arm. Uh, yeah. He oh, could really absolutely. throw the, he could really 70 throw the ball. Yards. I mean, that ball would, that ball would Spin. hum. It yeah. would, I mean, it would hum. You know, there's only a few guys that I, I know, like uh, the laces on the ball, when it starts rotating, it actually whistles. Yeah. There's like a little whistle sound to it. And Randall... And I played with Jeff George my last year oh, yeah. in, in Minnesota. Yeah. And they're the only two guys that I caught balls for. Well, tried to, I yeah. should say, because they were really coming in. And you could hear a little whistle coming into you. Jeff so. George, former number one pick. Man. Yep. Yeah, lot, yeah. Yep. Great, Absolutely. great quarterback. Yep. I'm gonna, let's put these pizzas in. I want to ask it. you about court, uh, field goal kickers that you watch and all that you like. Yep. And some that you've um, seen in the past that you, you admire. Go ahead, you could do that, Eddie, and we got time. Gotta get a little. I think we're good. Now that when you take that home to the wife, that's okay. Just, yeah, it'll be my fault. <laughs> you, you you made it. <laughs> yeah. There we go. There's one. That's the key right there. Yeah. Cindy and Nicole will be very happy. I'm bringing that home. Oh yeah. Little. We're gonna have to give that one a little bit of a blow. A little blow. There you go. Ah, there's the trick. So, Eddie. Yeah. I'm gonna give you a name. And to me, is a first ballot Hall of Famer, in my opinion. Yeah. Adam Vinatieri. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, he, um, uh, you know, he's had such a uh, long career, number one, which is also, uh, you know, a, a marker of a Hall of Famer. Yeah. Uh, but he's made some unbelievably clutch kicks. Is. And um, two of the Super Bowls alone for New England. He, exactly. He, he I mean, won. I, I think the best kick I've ever seen, I think maybe in the history of the NFL, was the playoff game. I believe it was against the Raiders, yes, and yeah. it was snowing like crazy. I yeah. mean, it was snowing like yeah. crazy. Cold, the New tuck, England, the tuck rule wind, game. everything. There you yeah. go, exactly right. The, the tuck rule game. 
and he I think it was a 46 yarder yes yeah uh, and made it snow was coming down I'm going snow that's the, the best kick I've ever seen in my life yeah, you know because just the conditions and and how the game was going and the importance of the game and uh, it was amazing you know uh, so yeah I, I he should be pretty much did your out. did your career cross paths with Jan Stenerud Yes, Jan's latter part of his career, when he left Kansas City, he went to Minnesota. That's right, so yeah. uh, we played against each other. Actually, um, my rookie year, I got asked to do a, a kicking camp in um, Wisconsin. And he and I were the instructors. And I had a great time with him. He was yeah. just such a uh, very great laid-back guy. I had a lot of respect for his career, and uh, he continued it with Minnesota. I think he played there for about three or four years, yeah. if I recall, yeah. afterwards. And, yeah. and, and, of course, was really the first pure kicker to be inducted into the Hall of Fame. Any kickers today that you, that you watch and say, man, he's, he's you know, He's, he's pretty good. Man, uh, well, Tucker, I, I think Tucker, oh, it, I, yeah. he's, the, he's the next future. I mean, just his accuracy, his power that he has. Uh, I pick him on is, my fantasy teams all the time. Uh, it, is, <laughs> it's just remarkable yeah. just what he has been able to do so far, and you don't see any drop-off. I mean, there's a lot. And he kicks outdoors, of, too. Yeah, and, and being outdoors yeah. on top of it, too. Uh, and, of course, I'm, you know, and I'm partial to the Detroit guys. I think yeah. Matt Prater is also... Yeah. You know, in the top five at least uh, with the kickers, he's got great power and great consistency. A lot of people don't know, Matt Prater was here late in the late 2000s. He tried out against Jason. Yes, For, he was basically yeah. Jason's. You know, to give him a break during preseason. Yep, exactly. And he was always knocking field goals in, and I'm like, mm -hmm. man, this kid's got a future. Yeah. They let him go. He went to Denver, and then the rest is history. Well, he's an example of where I was mentioned before. There, there are 30 jobs out there yeah but there are a handful of guys that deserve a job yeah so he didn't have a great situation because he was primarily brought in to just be a camp kicker which you know what it is you go in there and you do all that you can they're going to give you some kicks during preseason and maybe someone will see you yeah. and that was his situation so yeah. he came in knowing he wasn't going to make the team took the opportunity and then from that he ended up going to Denver and did a phenomenal yeah, job absolutely. and then of course you know we're lucky to have him here absolutely grab me that pan that's right up there we better check these things before oh yeah they're coming along they're coming along okay this one mine's looking awfully good I don't know about yours Freddie no, it's, sure, it's it's looking a little uh, see some, some of your meats on the back of the I know over there. It's <laughs> I like, did kind of stack it we'll, up a little we'll bit scoop that up. it's cooking fast so <laughs> yeah um, all right, let's get this uh, cheese pizza out here real quick. Actually, I'm gonna burn it. I'm gonna burn it a little bit more. So yeah, yours. See, my oven here. This oven is 1960, by the way. Oh, so wow. this is old, but I spend 12 hours of my life every day right yeah. here in this corner. So this is like, besides my wife and my kids, this is my baby. This is your right? baby this right is there. My baby absolutely. Right here. So old and dependable, right? So you play, yeah, absolutely. So you play for the Lions for 12 seasons, yep. and I don't know, you know, the draft. Obviously, the draft drafting way back then is much different. Yep. By the way, you were the number one. You were a first overall pick in uh, the CFL, not first overall in the no. first round in the CFL. Yes. In the CFL with uh, Hamilton, Hamilton Tiger Hamilton, Hamilton Tigers. Yes. So 1992 comes along. You're kicking for the Lions, and the Lions draft a, a field goal kicker in the second round, mm -hmm. which is unheard of. You don't you don't see that often. No. What's your what? Your, uh, did you see it? Did you hear it? What's your thoughts? I, I, the first I heard of what happened was the day of the draft. I remembered I went to a. Um, I, I didn't really pay attention, you know, to the draft. I was still you know working out and getting sure. ready and doing all this stuff. But I remembered being. I went to a Red Wing game, and I was at the Red Wing game, and I ran into a friend of mine, and. Um, he says, hey, I'm sorry to hear what happened with the Lions today. Wow. And, I'm, and I'm like, what? I mean, what happened to them? And he goes, you didn't hear? And I said, no. And he said, well, they drafted uh, a kicker. And I said, oh, okay. And uh, he said, well, they gave up two picks to the Dallas Cowboys, and they took their second-round pick and well, drafted a kicker. That. And I'm like, oh, wow. So I knew right away second round. that I wasn't going to be there anymore. So now it was, okay, I remember calling my agent, John Caponegro, who's locally here, and told him about what, was, uh, what had happened. And so we just then started, you know, strategizing about what was going on. So at that time, we were, okay, well, get ready for camp, go into camp. Um, you know, Sorry, we, will, uh, we will start... Uh, um, you know, maybe reaching out to some teams uh, to see if there's any, 
types of uh, interest for you and we'll just kind of go from there and I said okay so w we had a little bit of a, a plan for us at that time uh, about what to do because um, we knew that um, they were going to keep Jason. So um, two days later we had our mini camp so they always have um, the draft, and good. then they bring in all the draftees. Good job, by the way. Oh, good. Yeah, okay, good I got job. I got a future, right? Yes, you do. Okay. <laughs> so um, uh, I went into mini camp. Uh, we had all of our physicals, which is the first day, and then usually some of the draft picks. Uh, then all the draft picks start coming in at the beginning of camp. Uh, so um, all the draft picks were in, and um, we had a team meeting early in the morning. Uh, I was getting ready to go get changed for practice. And uh, Coach Fonts had um, one of the assistant guys who was up in his office uh, come down and says, hey, Coach Fonts wants to uh, meet with you. Mm. And I said, oh, okay. And I started getting my workout stuff on because I was going to go get a lift. And, and he goes, no, put your street clothes on. And I knew right away he was going to let me go. Yeah. And sure enough, I went up, uh, sat with him, and he goes, Ed, well, you know, you know the scenario, what's going on? And I said, yeah, but... Uh, I, I have a feeling you're going to release me or cut me or whatever you're going to do. And he goes, well, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do for you? And um, I said, well, it looks like you don't want me around. And he goes, Ed, I don't want you to go to camp with him because uh, I, I don't want any, you know, uh, you're going to screw with his head or any. And I said, coach, why would I do that? I said, I know the circumstance, yeah. okay? Why not have a veteran help him? You they know? didn't show much respect to you. Didn't, so, uh, what, uh, I, I, I get. well, I mean, I uh, will admit I was a little taken back that he thought yeah. I would try to jeopardize what the team was doing when yeah. all I was was thankful I had 12 phenomenal seasons yeah. with Detroit. Mm -hmm. And that was what I was trying to convey to him. You know, hey, I'll help him. Yeah. And he said, uh, no, uh, no, I, I'm not going to do that. Uh, so what do you want me to do? And uh, so I, I, I was hurt. I'll be honest with you. That's, I was interesting. Hurt by... That's interesting you say that because just as a fan growing up with Lions, Wayne Fonts is the guy you always think of the player. He was a player's coach. And sure. this is nothing against Wayne Fonts. Right. But you always hear him as the player's coach. And for you, hear you say that, that was kind of interesting because you've been there 12 years. You've kicked a lot of field goals for the right. team. And it almost sounded like a this, uh, kind of a shot at you. Like, hey, you're going to well, screw with his head. You know, I, uh, you know at the time, uh, so my answer to him was, well, what, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to try to trade you and all that kind of stuff? And so I thought, okay, well, you know, you're, you're – you're going to take this stand that you don't want me in and you think I won't be able to help yeah. with you, then what will be the least you get out of me? And they said, well, if we waive you, we get $100 or something like that. And I said, just waive me then and waive me. And I'll go figure out what I wanted to do yeah. at that. And so, then it was Tampa Bay. And then I ended up going uh, the latter half of the season with Tampa. Yeah. Amazing. Yes. Amazing. Amazing yeah. stuff. Let's transition to uh, Hope Network. I want to know what let's you're do doing it. with Hope Network. And Love let's cut to. these pizzas and we'll go have a seat. All right. All right. Sounds good. All right. Great. Look at that. Pro. Okay, and go ahead. Eddie, we're going to have you cut yours. Okay. And we're going to, let's leave this here. We're going to put that there. You want to, oh, you know what? I took yours off a tray. Uh-oh. I should know better. No big deal. You know how many pizzas I've cut on this day? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I would say uh, just this pan alone, I probably cut over half a million pizzas. Right I bet there. you have. You can <laughs> see all the half million, uh, million yeah, slices absolutely. right here. Absolutely. So I see you dig in. First, yeah. right? Get yep. going and then Absolute, go fast. Absolutely. I always boom, hit the cross and then I okay. cut. There you go. Look at that. How's Eddie, that? Eddie, you're hired. All right. All I got right. a download job. There you go. <laughs> All right. If you or your family is touched by autism, learn more about Freddy's Foundation at hashtag pop the tap at freddythepizzaman.com. That's F R E D I the pizzaman.com or email freddythepizzaman at gmail.com. Hey everyone, welcome into Inside the Pizza Oven. I am your host, <laughs> Freddie the Pizza Man. Joining me today is Super Bowl winner, Eddie Murray. I got to make him pizza today. I put him to work. Look at that cheese pie you I made. I tell you, Look you got that. a future here, Freddie. Absolutely, Freddy. absolutely. Well, Eddie, thank you. Thank Thanks you for, for being having here me. again. So, yes. 
Uh, you got a great story, and we obviously we touched a little bit on the story. So mm -hmm. I, I'd like to go back to England. Sure. So um, I had to ask you, I said, you know, you're a field goal kicker, and I, I assume that most field goal kickers started off as soccer players. Yep. So uh, what position did you play in soccer? Uh, well, I, I played them all. I know younger, I was more um, uh, winger because um, I, was, I was quick. I wasn't fast. Yeah. So I uh, played winger. Then I played a little bit of midfield, uh, even played goalkeeper for a couple of years and stuff. Uh, but uh, ended up uh, playing most of my time at, in, uh, at defense. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you know, I, it was a great base for me. Um, <clears throat> I was born in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia. And um, my father was in a uh, career naval officer for the Canadian Navy. So he was in World War II, Korean War. And so uh, after 25 years in 1960, um, he decided to move the family back to England where he was from. So uh, we moved to Portsmouth, England, which was actually where D-Day started from. It's a, big, it's a big naval base for the British, uh, uh, the British uh, Navy. How old uh, were you when you moved here? I moved when I was five. Oh, okay, so yeah. you were still relatively young. Yeah, so. I hadn't really started my school. Yeah. I, I think I had one year of school when I was living in Halifax. Yeah. So uh, I, I moved in 1960. We moved to uh, Portsmouth, England, and um, uh, proceeded to live there for uh, 10 years. So um, great experience growing up uh, there in the, from 60 to 70. Uh, unfortunately, my father passed away from cancer when I was 14. And um, I, ha I had an older brother and a uh, sister at the time. Uh, my brother was a uh, teacher in uh, Buckinghamshire, uh, England, which is a, like a suburb of London. Yeah. And my sister was married to a German and they were living in Baden-Baden, Germany. So my mother, um, <clears throat> during her time of grief, and she was a Canadian, she was actually born in, in St. John's, Newfoundland, so she's a Newf, uh, she wanted to be closer to her relatives. So um, her and I got on a plane, and uh, we moved to uh, Victoria, British Columbia, where most of her relatives at that time were living. Which you gave me a lesson in that today. That's near, <clears throat> near Vancouver. Both coasts, yeah. Both they're, coasts. Well, they're, they're both naval bases. So yeah. Halifax is the East Coast Naval Base for the Canadian Navy, and Victoria, British Columbia is the West Coast Naval Base. So my brother and sister were born in Victoria, and I was born when my father was based in Halifax. So you grew up in Manchester, United... Is it Manchester United? Manchester United was kind of my team back then in yeah. the 60s. And um, my hero, my person that I, I loved to watch at that time was a guy named Georgie Best. Yeah. And George was, uh, I would say at that time, was the Joe Namath of soccer. Yes. Uh, he was a good-looking, big head of hair, you know, the big lamb chop sideburns, yeah. and uh, had phenomenal individual skills and um uh, he was a sight to see. He really was. And he, he kind of captured my eye. And, and we used to do a lot of emulating of some of the things that he would do. And, of course, get nowhere near them because he was such a skilled player. He had, his dribbling skills were unbelievable. And, uh, yeah, that's good. I'm, I'm glad you said that because I was doing some research on him. And I, mm -hmm. he, they say he's a great, he was a great dribbler. What does that yeah. mean in, in, in soccer? Well, soccer now is um, uh, there's a lot of um, passing of the ball. Back in the, in the 60s, uh, passing was big, but it was also, you know, uh, people taking the ball on and, and taking on um, uh, other t uh, the, the defenders and trying to beat them individually. Where soccer has evolved, where th that they and a lot of it came out of the Brazilian game. The Brazilian game it was a triangle game. Yeah. So you you kick it to a forward person and you try to have two people on each side that he could that he could put the ball off of, and then you create triangles all over the field and that way you don't have to dribble around someone you pass it around them and so that's where the game was devolved but back at that time there was a lot of uh, ind individual play of people's skill that they had and and he just kind of had it in spades there were a lot of uh, Rodney Marsh was another good player back at that time uh, and of course Bobby Charlton who also played for Manchester United was also an, another really good uh, dribbler of the ball but there, there was um, just a litany of them but he was kind of head and shoulders about everybody else. So then maybe his fame <coughs> then you could maybe equate to Christian, Christian uh, am I saying is right Christian Ronaldo? Christian, uh, oh Cristiano Ronaldo Christian, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah I, I, especially yeah I mean there's been a lot of the guys I mean there's uh, Ronaldinho uh, for uh, Brazil oh, yeah. who had uh, great skill also uh, you got Neymar now who uh, plays for PSG uh, yeah, yeah, there, are, there are so many of them that have that skill, but the, the tactics of the game has changed more. Coaches want you to be able to 
accept the ball and have control of the ball, but then they want you to get rid of the ball. The ball is the fastest player on the, on the pitch. Yeah. So back then it was you needed to be fast and have the ability to dribble through people and get by people, where now they, they want the ball to do the work. Yeah. So, and, and, it's, and, and just in doing a little research on him, I, I, you know, I, uh, Pele and uh, Diego Maradona. Yeah. Uh, we, you know, there's a story out, you know, he, 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 loved, he played hard on the soccer field. He partied hard off the field. Yep. Um, but those two were there at his, uh, when, he, when he died. He was yes. there at the end. Yeah, they had you great know, respect. Two, two of the greats. Pele and, and uh, Maradona <laughs> had uh, yeah. great respect for George Best's yeah. uh, ability on the field. And, um, yeah, unfortunately, you know, uh, Georgie liked to party a lot off the field, and yeah. uh, he was known for that, and uh, he embraced it. And unfortunately, uh, you know, alcohol uh, got him at the end. He had a lot of uh, liver issues, yeah. uh, and uh, he, he died way too young. Uh, but he, uh, uh, he was a candle that burnt really, really uh, brightly when he was on the field. It's not hard to get a pint in uh, England now. I no, I no <laughs> not at that time. No, it sure wasn't. So your love of soccer, your love of George Best, when did you realize, hey, I can kick field goals? Well, when I moved uh, to Victoria, British Columbia, of yeah. course, you know, I grew up my adolescent two years, uh, you know, playing soccer and rugby and cricket. Those were kind of like my three big sports. And uh, when I moved to Victoria, uh, I was happy to see that those sports were there. Um, there was very, uh, a lot of English traditions uh, in Victoria at that time. There was a lot of soccer and rugby going on. They even had cricket, although I didn't play, uh, I didn't play uh, any cricket at all when I moved to uh, Canada. But because of my aptitude of uh, being able to kick a soccer ball really hard and to kick rugby and, and to make field goals in rugby and stuff, I had uh, some of the people that I was going to school with, they said, hey, you know, we have football. And uh, this is how we play football here, not football like you grew up playing. Yeah. And uh, so I, I tried out. I, I like the physicality part of it because, of, of course, playing, with, playing rugby, it was a physical game also. And I just kind of transitioned over to it. You know, I played defensive back. I played uh, slot back, wide receiver. Uh, like I said, I wasn't fast. I was quick. Had really good hands. Um, but you can kick a ball. But I could kick a ball. Yeah. And so things just kind of fell into place. I mean, did I want to be a field goal kicker? No, I did not grow up. I wanted to be a professional soccer player. And that was my mindset. Even during my high school years when I was there, I wanted to go and, and advance my soccer career as much as, as, much as I could. But when I, um, when I got out of high school, uh, the only, because uh, I was actually out of high school a year before I got a scholarship offer from Tulane University. So I was um, working for a friend of mine's father owned a lumber yard. I was driving a three-ton three forklift, working on the lumber yard, helping customers out with pulling wood or plywood or whatever that they yeah. needed and help them and stuff. And um, film of me didn't cross two lane, which again, that's a whole another story, uh, uh, until I was out uh, a year. And unfortunately, at the same time, my, my mother was dying of cancer at the time because she died about a month before I went to two lane. And um, so my, my, I threw all my eggs in the, uh, the basket to play soccer. And I kind of pushed the field goal thing uh, out. And then when I got the scholarship offer, I remember going to my uh, soccer coach, Joe Beckers, who was kind of like my father figure at that time. He was very close to me, he yeah. and his family, uh, which I still greatly appreciate. Uh, and I love going back to Victoria and seeing him still, he and his wife, Judy. And um, he said, look, you know, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. You got someone who wants to give you a free education. Take it and go and see what this football thing will do for you. And it was the smartest decision I ever made. So I, I got my degree from Tulane, which was not the easiest thing, because I hated school. I, I was not a good student. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna say to you, if you're British Columbia all the way to Tulane. That, that, was, a, that, that was a big culture That's shock. a long way. Was there, yeah. any, was there any other schools that offered you? Uh, no, um, I did get, I, I, I can't say no. I did get a, uh, an offer from Tulsa, University of Tulsa. I remember it was F.A. Dry was the coach there. But because of me being in uh, Canada, they had a hard time trying to translate my, my uh, grades from uh, high school. And he said, hey, we want to put you in junior college for a couple of years and get your grades up, because he knew I wasn't the greatest of students, and then go. Where Tulane said, hey, we want you to come here. We'll help you. you know, um, 
and uh, we'll get you the tutors that you're going to need to you know, keep yourself eligible. And uh, so I, d I chose Tulane. You said something that, that sparked me there, but quickly, the, the football fields, and in, in, I know in, in the football fields in the CFL. Yeah, they're are much wider, wider. and longer. Are they yes. like that in high school as well, too? Yes. Oh, yeah. really? Yes, they are. Okay, so there's yeah. not much of a transition. No, no. So, okay, so you said something that, that sparked me that um, you played soccer, cricket, and uh, football. Rugby. Rugby. The rugby, excuse yes. me, rugby. Mm -hmm. And high school kids today, you hear this a lot, mm -hmm. uh, they, they stick to one sport. Mm -hmm. And what, what's your thoughts on it? Because I'm the believer that they should play a lot of sports because if you ever get into a situation like you did, like I wanted to play soccer, but maybe football was there, mm -hmm. you had something to kind of fall back on that you're playing a bunch of sports, you learn different things. Well, uh, there, there's two ways of looking at it. Mm -hmm. If you think back, when, you know, I, I went through high school from... Um, <clears throat> until 76. So back in those days, even, even in the United States, you didn't have the pay for play. Yeah. So um, like I tell people my, I, I remembered when I went to Tulane, you know, you'd see the, uh, they would have blurps on the freshman coming in and they would go, oh, he's a, um, you know, a three, uh, three sport athlete. He's, uh, a, you know, eight time letterman and all of that. Future Super Bowl. You know, all, well, no, I mean, but they would have all <laughs> of these things. So then I remember talking to the sports information director and he said, hey, Ed, we want, need to make a bio of you that we're yeah. going to put in our media guide. You know, what, what sports did you play? And I said, well, I played on the high school soccer team, high school rugby team. Yeah. I was on the uh, track team. I was on the so uh, field lot. hockey team. Yeah. I was on the badminton team. And um, no wonder you concentrate also, on your homework. And also, <laughs> I played outside soccer, outside rugby. Yeah. And so they're gone. You mean so you played that all four years? And so they add that up, and yeah. it's like, well, four years of soccer, four years of rugby, four years of field, field hockey, four yeah. years of. And they're gone. You mean you're like a 20, 20 year sport? And they couldn't fathom that. You know, so I was to say, now you know why I wasn't a good student. I was yeah. always on the field. <laughs> I wasn't at home studying. But that that for me. I didn't play hockey. I had guys who did, had my schedule, and they also played ice hockey. You know, yeah. I might be the only Canadian that can't skate. That's one thing I can't do. You yeah. know, so uh, uh, there are other guys who did more things than I did. Yeah. And but that was norm back then. Nowadays, when with the pay for play, it becomes a little bit more specialized because yeah. parents have to pick and choose where they're going to put their money to yeah. support their child. But then they stick to one sport. And maybe they get burnt out too they soon. They can get burned out. Yeah, and then maybe there was, there was another option there that could have been there for sure. them, and they didn't. Sure. You know, well, see I mean, when you look at that the, that point of view, yeah. like I, I had no, no idea that I would be able to go to, uh, to a college on a scholarship to just kick a football and then to have the career that I had. I had no aspirations yeah. of that. But because I was a rounded athlete and I played these different sports, um, I was lucky that things had that so there there is some validity to what you're saying if you try some different things that maybe something else will crop up that yeah. uh, is really where you have your aptitude in uh, but if you just stick with one thing and you don't do it really good you, you never know. Yeah, yeah. And, and I don't know so. the facts but I do know that they do say that if you play a lot of sports in, in, uh, in high school you, you tend to be more you tend to make more friends you tend to do better in school sure so there's just a lot involved with it there is a yeah, lot there is. yeah absolutely so. yeah let's uh, let's uh, transition to the great things you're doing with hope network yes so mm -hmm. um, hope network how, how long have you been with hope network uh, I've been honored to be with them for now 10 years yeah. uh, I uh, I first started out Phil Weaver our CEO uh, approached me I was actually at a uh, golf outing here locally uh, that was raising money for Hope Network uh, through a friend of mine uh, that I just got acquainted to at the time and um, participated in the golf outing. Uh, Phil thanked me for uh, attending and asked if um, uh, I would be interested in having lunch with him the following week, which I did, and uh, he offered me to sit on their foundation board. And I said, well, Phil, I'll be honest with you. I've never been asked to sit on a board. What do you need me to do? And he said, I just need you to be an ambassador. Uh, we're, we're based up in Grand Rapids. We have services around the state. Yeah. But we need more of a presence in southeast Michigan. And I think you would be a, a good person for us to um, have on our board and to speak of the east side of the state uh, with the other board members that we have. And there are people like Dan DeVos that are on the board. A lot of the philanthropic people of yeah. western Michigan uh, are up there and supporting Hope Network's efforts. And so I said, fine, I'm your man. So 
the first seven years of my Hope Network experience was to sit on their foundation board. Uh, I had a golf outing, which uh, I've had for, this is now going to be uh, my um, seventh uh, golf outing at Oakland University. When is it this year? Uh, June 22nd. June 22nd. Yep. And, um, how can people they get can go to well, people can go to hopenetwork.org uh, okay. okay. on our events uh, tab in our website, and uh, people can go there and register. Uh, if uh, they have any other interests, they can reach out to the foundation. Uh, they have a separate fo uh, foundation tab up there if anybody needs additional information, and um, uh, they can forward uh, information in regarding to signing up or sponsorship uh, that they have at that time. I know you have a couple of things going on locally here with Madonna and Ladywood, yes. but uh, people that don't know, tell people what Hope Network is all about. Uh, Hope Network is about a 58-year-old charity based out of Grand Rapids. Um, the talking points, you know, we're, we're about a $170 million nonprofit, about 3,300 employees. Uh, we service over 35,000 mental health patients in every county in Michigan. So we have uh, neural rehab facilities around the state. We have uh, social services where people can go and continue to get uh, help uh, all around the state. Uh, we also have um, early diagnosis autism centers. So we started the autism centers uh, before here in Michigan. It wasn't until 2013 where it became covered by Medicaid, Medicare. Yeah. Uh, so w we had it two years prior to that. We went ahead and said we need to have this. We need to give services out to early diagnosis kids, which are basically from one to six, um, a little bit older maybe, uh, seven and eight. But that's kind of what we concentrate on uh, because uh, research has shown uh, the earlier you can diagnose a child, the better the outcomes can, yeah. uh, can be for Early the child. Early education, too. As, as yeah. you know, yeah. personally. Uh, so... Um, you had mentioned about the Madonna situation. Yeah. So our, our newest uh, venture into uh, our early diagnosis is going to be on the Madonna uh, University campus yeah. at the Ladywood um, location. Uh, Ladywood was the private girls' school that yeah. was on their campus. They closed down. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. a couple of years ago, uh, enrollment was down enough that they made the decision to close the school. Yeah. Uh, so we have, as a matter of fact, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, finally signed our agreement with them. And our desire is we will be up and ready to um, do services by June. So um, we're really excited about this. It, this is now going to be our fourth uh, early diagnosis center. We have two centers in Grand Rapids. Uh, we have another one uh, that is in Holland. And this one will now be our uh, fourth one here. Southeastern Michigan. Southeastern Michigan. Yeah. And, um, you know, unfortunately, the numbers are going the wrong way. I right. know when I got involved 10 years ago, it was like 1 in 70 children fell across the spectrum. It might have been 1 in 100 Well, now it's 1 in 55. The numbers are going the wrong way. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and um, we're but doing like everything. Said, early education. Early that education is, is that, very that, key. That, that is the key. Uh, what, what, we need to be out there educating, right? Exactly. We, what, what, you're, what you're doing with the sensory rooms is key. Yeah. It really is because, um, you know, if you think of it like when I was in high school, the kids that now we know had autism, they were the special ed kids, right? Yeah. They were separated. Yeah. They weren't included in what the activities yeah. were, let alone the day-to-day -day life that the students were going through. And that d just isn't healthy. No. It's not healthy. No, absolutely the not. more you can have inclusion for the children and get them to be in the regular school day and they, quote unquote, may have their issues and that if they have a sensory yeah. room that you support, which yeah. is phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, I think some teachers wish they could go to these sensory I rooms know. Know. when they get overloaded, yeah. that they could have a moment to just kind of decompress and that's really all it yeah. is. My, my son, personal note, I mean my son is a, my son is in gen ed, first grade, and mm -hmm. my wife and I, he, you know, he'll be in the class most of the time, but when he needs to decompress, needs a moment, the resource room or the sensory room, yep. and uh, instead of, like you said, just push him to the side all day long, yep. include him in as much as you can, because eventually with early education mm -hmm. and accept, acceptance and awareness that the older they get, the more they'll just be like everybody else in this exactly world. right and that's the way we should all exactly should be, right you know? yeah so. and i know for us we're, we're very fortunate we have a uh, a new director of autism services at hope network uh, michelle o'connor talinsky yeah. and uh, she is a 100 percent advocate of inclusion so all of her 
programs and how she wants to set up now the new uh, facilities as well as um, change some of the um, education with the facilities that we have up and running. It's always inclusion. It's always inclusion. That's her belief, yeah. and um, that's what I believe in, yeah. and I know you do too. Yeah. Uh, that the, the more you can get the child to be around other kids, yeah. and the kids to understand that, hey, they they need their alone time now and again, and it's it's nothing wrong. Uh, they're, they're you know you can't catch anything. It's not you know any of those stigmas that are out there. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know you, you can break them down early. Uh, the better it's going to be not only for the kids that don't have autism, that they get to experience just how special some of these autism children are. Again, you know, I see it with my son, first grade. I, 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 when I pick him up at school, I pick him up one day a week, and when I see him come out of school and, and the girls are like, bye, Antonio, <laughs> hi, Antonio. <laughs> yeah. And I'm thinking that he's part of that. And yeah. if he was pushed to the side, he would never he, experience that. No, and, and, and I know yeah. the, kid, the first graders don't get it. Yeah. You know, they, they don't really know what's going on. But eventually... We get more information in schools. Yeah, yep, um, absolutely. That that would help, but yes. it just the, I think about it. I sometimes I break down in my in the car by myself, thinking he wouldn't be part of that if yep. he wasn't in the, in the classroom. Just, just that just that one gesture of kindness or absolutely. acknowledgement absolutely. could mean the absolute world to that child at that moment, that yeah. autistic child. Yeah. But it it also it hopefully will fall back into the, the non autistic child that they hey. I can't be friends with this kid. There's yeah. really nothing wrong. Yeah. Every now and again, he just needs to kind of decompress yeah. or she needs to decompress. And if they, they can learn that at a younger age, yeah. then it becomes more the norm. And, and maybe, that's what we're trying to find. And, and the kid that they say is normal, maybe they'll change them too. Exactly. You it it definitely will. Yeah, it definitely absolutely. Will. Yes. Check back next week to see part two of our interview with Eddie Murray. Les Stanford Chevrolet Cadillac is a family-owned and operated full-line Chevrolet Cadillac dealership located in downtown Dearborn, Michigan. For the past 50 years, Les Stanford has been dedicated to excellent customer service in sales, service, and auto body repair. We have all the resources available to make a fantastic car buying and servicing experience. This includes a massive selection of Chevrolet, Cadillac, and certified pre-owned inventory to choose from, free loaner vehicles for service and collision center customers, and a finance source for every type of credit situation. Come experience the Les Stanford Chevrolet Cadillac difference today by visiting our showrooms in Dearborn, Michigan, or shop online at lesstanford.com.